thank you very much. Those were excellent um, presentations. Uh, uh, very, really interesting, fascinating um, interactions and intersections as well between the various um, uh, uh, discussions. Um, I, I, I guess one of my first questions, just <coughs> building off what Ian was just discussing, um, is language a tool? That's to the panel, so whoever wants <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think tool, uh, the, the concept of tool is an extremely broad, broad one. And we're very limited in the Pleistocene in what we can regard as tool because tools are pretty straightforward. And certainly the ones that preserve are very straightforward indeed. But as we come closer to, uh, to, to modern time, uh, the, uh, you know, the concept of a tool is anything that facilitates anything that humans do. And I guess, in that sense, you would have to regard the language as a, as a tool. And uh, certainly, but tools, tools as, you know, as, as a concept, in concept, much predated language. I mean, the earliest tool using, uh, tool making, goes back to sometime between about two and a half million years ago and three and a half million years ago. Uh, now, it's a very ancient behavior based, obviously, on very, <coughs> Uh, very, very ancient uh, neural circuits are the kinds that have been uh, described. And um, <coughs> so, in and of itself, you know, it is not a prerequisite, certainly, for language. So, <coughs> you know, these, all, these kinds of questions come down to definitions, of course. But you run a, d a danger with that kind of a, a notion of, yeah, <coughs> language is a tool and, and other things or tools. Um, the danger is smearing across really important distinctions that we know exist neurobiologically. So language and language disorders um, rely on a different system, different circuitry from the, the kinds of things that uh, I was trying to describe earlier. Nevertheless, one of the interesting, really interesting things about this so-called system that, that's uh, involved in um, representing tools is that it is extremely left lateralized. That is, there's, it, these areas are much stronger in the left hemisphere, as are many of our components of language. Um, as, as well as our, you know, most of you are right-handed, as well as your ability to do the fine manipulation with your right hand for the use of tools. So those three factors need to be kind of uh, unpacked and, and um, we're still in the process of figuring out how they're related because it's not clear, for example, what is the relationship between language development mm -hmm. on the one hand and this left lateralized system for tool use um, and and what's the relationship between this left lateralized uh, system for tool use and our ability to manipulate with, the, with the, uh, the right hand so there's some linkage for sure oh, should we take questions sure I guess. who's gonna I, it's with a little microphone, I guess. Sorry. Is there a microphone? Is there a microphone? Because they're all wired. You, you can come over here and Would you talk. Like a, Why not? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, again, I'd like to expand the notion of language from words spoken to other people to gesture, body, and other forms <coughs> of communication. Chomsky's view of language isn't social or communicative. It's the way the brain talks to itself, and I quote mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. So if we look at language that way, as gesture moving with a body, that even actions have their own grammar, mm -hmm. using actions have their own grammar that's hierarchical mm -hmm. in many of the ways that language is, yeah. perhaps we could see it as not sudden, yeah but more gradual? Well, you know, uh, Chomsky himself would, uh, would make a distinction between uh, language and communication. And I think that's a very, very important kind of, uh, uh, kind of distinction to make. Virtually all vertebrates communicate. Right? All complex organisms communicate 
in uh, in some way, and there are chemical means of communication, and there are there's the sound, but and there's vision, and there's any sense that you want is going to be uh, involved in, uh, in in communication by some uh, organism or another. But language is something special, and I think language is all about the manipulation of information and the recombination according to rules. And I think this is what Chomsky is getting at. I wouldn't, you know, I. You know, people when they're when they're talking, they I'm particularly uh, guilty of this. They throw their arms around, you know, and they do all this pantomime and stuff. And clearly, what language is doing is 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 it's superimposed in some way in some older form of communication and gestural communication. I think was very important in the hominid past. But I think that language as as a way of um, <coughs> manipulating information. Um, is a very important, uh, it very importantly different from any other form of uh, communication. And it shouldn't be primarily thought of, maybe, as a means of communication. Although it might have been. I, you know, Chomsky and I differ. On, he thinks that uh, language was a portal to internal thought and only later was re recruited for, uh, for uh, communication. Where I think there was a feedback between the two and you really can't, uh, can't make a distinction. How else can you imagine a non-linguistic creature beginning to talk? I think the other thing about language though is that what language gives you, and I'm, I'm agreeing with you for these mm -hmm. purposes, I want to talk about the psychological definition of mm -hmm. language as opposed to communication. But I think one thing that language gives you is the ability to tell stories. And I think that's quite interesting as well because you can then go places in the mind's eye, mm -hmm. in the imagination, that only exist in fiction. You can go to places mm -hmm. and times that don't actually exist now mm -hmm. and perhaps never will other than in the story. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, my voice is good. Can you just hear me without having the mic? So, um, you ever notice there's this whole business of artificial intelligence, which uh, unfortunately gets way, way more buzz and probably a lot more money than what you guys are doing. Um, anyway, and as hopefully a lot of people know by now, there's basically two kinds. There's pattern recognition, mm -hmm. essentially glorified curse hitting is actually where most of the activity is. And then there's this business of general AI, mm -hmm. which is a totally different animal, really the Wild West. Um, so I'm wondering, and you know, general AI, forget about, leaving aside how close it is to human intelligence, are any of you aware of how close general, a, general AI might be towards some of the animal scale problem solving, particularly like what the crows are doing, uh, which I found really, really fascinating. It, but this whole business of solving problems without being told what the problem is, even just hand a set of objects. Yeah, so um, I've done some collaborative work with Murray Shanahan, who's um, the Professor of Cognitive Robotics at Imperial University in London. <coughs> and one of the things that he was interested in doing is seeing whether you could generate a, a robot, an ICOB, that would be capable of doing some of these decisions. And as far as I know, so far the general consensus in this sort of area is that a lot of the things that we think might be quite simple are relatively easy to generate. And a lot of the things that we think should be very simple, that action, for example, is incredibly hard to program a robot to do. Um, but I think it's going to be interesting over the next few years if more of the people from these different, clearly related areas get together and share their information to move <coughs> the fields forwards so that they don't just become independent parallel streams. <coughs> the only thing I would add to that is that, since you brought up AI, that there's a huge difference between getting a machine to do something mm -hmm versus what our brains do. And just because, you know, it, 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 there are people that are, for very good reasons, interested in getting machines to do, for example, face recognition or all kinds of problems, like playing chess, 
um, and 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 it could be done really remarkably well, but that doesn't mean that what that machine is doing has any bearing on what the human brain is doing. And those things need to be really kept very distinct and separate. Andrew. Andrew. Thanks very much. Um, I have a question about the how objects become tools and how tools acquire new um, activities. Particularly, I was struck by the finding that a belt is different than a tool. And you, you gave a helpful Professor Martin, definition that tools are those which the movement is, is directly related to the function. But then I might be in a situation where a belt could become a tool where I need to use it as a tool. And I was provoked by the finding that there's a separate brain system for these things. How does one become the other? And how can we use our existing knowledge to make objects into tools? So that's, that's a great question. I actually was going to talk about this issue of, of functional fixity, which is the classic example. And you know, I was going to show, for example, a picture of a hammer. If you had a, you know, hang, hang a picture up, you'd grab a hammer. But if you didn't have a hammer, you could use your shoe, right? <coughs> and you overcome the notion, well, it's only for that. In terms of that neural system, what I was pointing out was that outside the context of using these things for anything else, there is this distinction, right? So what the prediction would be is that if you showed those objects that I was saying you manipulate but do not use the tools, but show them in a context where in fact they were being used that way, then the prediction is you would grab that tool-like system that it's not tied to, oh, it's only screwdrivers and hammers and so on. It's any implement within the context of being used to perform a function, like picking up your shoe and using it as a hammer. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but that's the experiment one could do. And like I said, we know what we would predict. It's context dependent. I'll follow that up by asking where hammers go when they end up in uh, symbols like the hammer and sickle? Again, I, yeah, so I think what we're learning about, you know, object perception, for example, the level of semantics or concepts, that what really matters is how the thing is interpreted, right? You know, a teddy bear is not a living thing, and you expect a different kind of, of um, response. When I was showing you those circles and squares, if they were just circles and squares moving randomly, then you get a whole different network that, that comes online. So it's all about, I think, the meaning that is assigned to objects, let alone versus, you know, there's a set, uh, uh, unchangeable meaning. Can I just quickly ask you, and this is a very simple question, I'm ignorant. Is using a tool, does it activate the same areas, or can you do those experiments in F fMRI yeah. machines, are, or, or is it just about representing and, yeah. and watching tool use? So uh, the quick answer is <clears throat> yes. These are the same areas that are involved. But the overriding notion behind all of this work is that these basic features are stored right in our perception action, emotion, you know, uh, uh, emotion and motion systems. However, it's kind of higher order, more abstract level of representation. But people who have done actual studies of manipulation within the context of a tool, you see these same okay. systems yeah. go on. Plus there's a lot of, I didn't mention any, there's a lot of monkey work to support mm -hmm. which areas would be involved in them. Getting back to our subject on paleontology, uh, there's a statuette in a German museum that was dated to 30,000 years ago, and it's of a standing lion. What is its significance? It's closer to 40,000 years ago. This is uh, an amazing thing from uh, <coughs> a site called Hollenstein Stadel in uh, southern Germany. It's a statuette about this high of a, uh, of a, 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 a individual with a human body and a lion's head. And that is sort of looked upon as being the ultimate 
a symbolic object because it's combining two things that you can only you can only see the the combination as a result of somebody having imagined it rather than uh, as something that can be uh, observed in the in, in the outside world and yeah I mean it's it's it, it is one of the most clearly uh, most quintessentially symbolic objects you can imagine I have no idea what his cultural connotations were. This is one of the great mysteries of I Say John. We know that it was dripping with, uh, with uh, symbolic significance, but we don't know what that uh, significance exactly was. I mean, that is something that died with the culture uh, that, uh, that produced it. And that's because symbols are arbitrary. Symbols are not related necessarily to the item um, which they uh, represent, you know, in a, in a, in a visual or uh, any other sense. They are just something that arbitrarily stands for something else, and and we really can't know. And when you go into those caves in, in, in France and in Spain, it's 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 wonderful, and you, you just want to, want to know why. And unfortunately, it's a uh, it's a question that you really have to uh, have to to some extent uh, suppress. It's the basic question, and these definition questions for me are really difficult. You know, so I went again to the you know Wikipedia and copied out their definition of tool, and I was going to show a picture from uh, last night's giant game, where I mean a football fits perfectly, you know, with the typical notion of what a tool is. But you know, it's an object, and it's a function. We throw it, but most people would not intuitively consider. So. I guess, I, I don't know, but it can't be. I mean, the, the, the data that that Nikki showed us with those crows. I mean, those are tools. There's no question that they're tools. There's no hand involved, but it's a problem. That, actually, you should give what you think <laughs> the definition is. But it's just a, you know, it's unbelievable that that little bird brain could come up with these behaviors and this level of creativity and problem solving. Mm -hmm. And I think in any everybody's definition, those things would qualify as tools. Mm. I think the animal literature, the comparative literature, probably has a much narrower definition of tools, um, which in some ways is a good thing, and in other ways is a bad thing in equal measure, right, depending on your perspective. It's good in the comparative work because a lot of these bigger concepts about tool, what tools might entail are uh, irrelevant within the comparative domain. You know, in the absence of language in the animals, prior to the development of fully flourishing language in kids, those concepts, th there's nothing we can do with them. So I, I think most people in, in the comparative and developmental work fields would be thinking about objects that allow you to obtain a reward that you otherwise couldn't get. So obviously you don't want to say it depends on hands, otherwise you rule out anything other than vertebrates, uh, mammals, and even then only certain kinds of mammals. But something that can be used to get something you wouldn't otherwise get. And yet, whilst you were talking, I, I was thinking of another thing that I was thinking, I hadn't really thought of it in this way before. But I've been doing ballet for years and I still go on point. Now, my point shoes are actually a tool. <coughs> There's no way I could go on point without them. But they don't allow me really to reach something that I otherwise couldn't reach. They don't fit the animal definition of a tool. But I think they fit they your fit, definition of a tool. They do, and tool. they fit the idea of a goal. Yeah. Obtaining a goal yeah. that you couldn't do otherwise. Yeah. Uh, Alessandra. Yeah. 
life separate from involving the seven mm -hmm. or even so far. Whereas mm -hmm. the first song was instead leading me to think of learning to use tools as a step towards the cognitive development of children and human beings and with the word of sort of continuing. So how should I think? Well, I think there's a lot of evidence to talk about different types of intelligence. I mean, Howard Gardner set this going back in the 1970s about uh, um, multiple intelligences. The so, I mean, you you see it most prominently in autism, where you have a developmental disorder that its very core is about a lack of social intelligence in a sense, a lack of understanding interactions of others. And we deal a lot with adolescent and teenage autistic individuals. And what are they interested in? What do they spend their time with is the mechanical world, right? They're great at that kind of stuff and they love puzzles and video games and machinery and so on. So there's a lot of evidence from neurological disorders and just from our own you know, uh, ideas of how the world works that there are these different levels of intelligence. Nevertheless, in the normal human brain, when people are put into, for example, problem solving situations, then there's got to be a lot of interaction between social mm -hmm. understanding, like in the, uh, in the videos that Nikki was showing, between, for example, the child and the experimenter and setting up a situation, which by definition is a social situation, mm -hmm. right? Normally, the, all this stuff gets integrated. How that occurs, by the way, uh, we really have hardly mm -hmm. any understanding. Mm -hmm. So maybe the way to think about all these kind of abilities is both dedicated neural systems and tremendous interaction, which in the human brain we think of both frontal areas, mm -hmm. in the crows, who knows? This is like one of the most compelling questions in all of <laughs> neurobiology. How are they doing this mm -hmm. stuff that she showed? Mm -hmm. um, and anyway. with, with huge brains too, because their brains relative to body size are as big as those of chimpanzees and the other non-human great apes. But I think in the comparative literature, um, we do see physical and social cognition as different, interrelated but different. So I didn't talk about that today, but certainly when people talk about how did primates get their intelligence and their big brains, primates in general and humans in particular, there are two main classes of theories about how this came about. One is the social function of intellect hypothesis that was really most clearly expressed originally by Nick Humphrey, and, but hinted on about 10 years beforehand by Alison Jolly. Um, and then there's the physical, and the physical has been done in terms of extractive foraging, which relates directly back to the tools, and also to physics of, of time, of having to keep track of ripening fruits or perishing foods. And they're, they're generally sort of thought as two different theories that might explain. Although, of course, it's a chicken and egg argument and that there could easily be a combination of the two. So I, I don't think the comparative work suggests that there isn't a distinction. It's just that it wasn't one I was bringing up today because of the time constraints on the. I was wondering about the continuity between the evidence for tool making, the old evidence for tool making in the system that you find in the term brain. So you find a very distinct modular function of the brain, which you know operates in very specific situations. But we know from the work of Stanislav Gahan and others that our systems which are modular, right, and they operate in very certain specific circumstances, but they are not developed in the course of the evolution. Because, for example, in this case, the work from area, it's a new area that didn't have time to develop over, over uh, evolution. So I was wondering whether there's a connection between this old history uh, related to neuro neurobiology and what you are finding in the brain. I don't know. I mean, I don't know how to kind of address that 
to that question. So, so to be specific, do you think that this pool, this area is, is more like the work from area, this is a new kind of specialized area developed mm -hmm. uh, on a cultural level, or is an older area that happens to develop across uh, uh, evolutionary time? So, um, what this question relates to is this thing called the visual word form area. Um, clearly, and the puzzle has been this business about um, reading is a, is a new ability. Um, but clearly it was built out of something much older, whether it's our ability to, to uh, um, resolve fine you know, uh, uh, lines versus more mm -hmm. global images or something. And language certainly is older than the reading system. And just to clarify this, this whole puzzle, um, what makes that area special is the connectivity between this particular piece of cortex and the language system. So there had to be some kind of constraints that were set up a long time ago that dictated where information was going to flow, and then th this area was kind of, uh, of, of mm -hmm. taken over for reading. So it's not quite the kind of puzzle the way it's been posed, mm -hmm. if you think of it in the broader context of language development. Now, the system I was describing to you for the tools, I think, my, my intuition is that this is a very old kind of uh, from an evolutionary standpoint, it's the co-opting of, of um, systems that were in place long before we came on the scene because we can see the, the remnants of this in, uh, in the monkeys that are here now. And that is the separation of systems for perceiving and storing information about form, motion, manipulation, and so on. That stuff is so you can, you know, most of the information we knew about the way that was set up came from studies in the macaque. And the same kind of architecture seems to hold in our brain, right? So, uh, and also, uh, by the way, monkeys looking at objects they've learned to manipulate will activate some of the very same tissue in their brains that looks like the homologue to the stuff I was showing you. So it suggests kind of that we co-opted during evolution stuff that was there for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Please join me in thanking the speakers.